Holy One, we pray that in the written word and in the spoken word, we will always hear your living word, Jesus Christ. Amen. So Christians testify that there is one reigning over all of humanity and all of creation. A king, to use the traditional patriarchal language. The thing about kings, though, is we say the word king and we think of the history of human kings. And in history, and even today, a king, a queen, any person in power is distant from common people because human beings are always located somewhere in space. Queen Elizabeth II, still the reigning monarch over our constitutional monarchy, She's over our media much of the time. We feel like we know her. But the chances of us running into her one afternoon down the local IGA are infinitesimally lower than the chances of you or I being struck by lightning in our lifetime. Monarchs are removed from the people. Traditionally, Christians will often describe Christ as reigning in a distant heaven. And we have generally spoken about this throne being very, very far away, like the distance between here and Buckingham Palace multiplied by a few light years. So today is our last Sunday before Advent. And so the last Sunday of the church's year, and, I, and that's not something we often talk about perhaps in the churches of Christ, but, but by the liturgical calendar, this is effectively our 31st of December, our New Year's Eve. Because the first Sunday of Advent is effectively our January 1st. It marks the beginning of each new church year. So we begin each new year of the church in the season of waiting for the coming of the birth of Christ. And we end each church year on this Sunday dedicated to the reign of Christ, to Christ's kingship. It's still sometimes called, as Dot said, the Feast of Christ the King. So we're about to move in one week from today's awe and reverence of Christ omnipresent as a centre and pinnacle of all our reality, into the advent expectation of a coming, of a coming Christ that we all long for, who will be born into the humblest of human circumstances. And though that contrast feels very right with my soul, it does get the gears of my tiny human mind whirring, expressed beautifully, I think, in the second hymn, Dot Cho's Meekness and Majesty, that contrast. And we should notice by our designations of both reign of Christ or Christ the King that we specifically focus on that word Christ. Let's be very clear that Christ was not the surname of Jesus of Nazareth. We wouldn't have found him under Christ, Jesus in the Judean white pages. Jesus the Christ is a clearer way of saying it as Christ is a title that captures and extends all other titles used for the risen and crucified Jesus of Nazareth, the Word of God, the true vine, the Son of Man, the Son of God, Lord, and many more. The passage from the letter to the Ephesians we heard today describes Christ as one who fills all in all. The writer of this letter, and it's probably worth acknowledging for those people who are biblical textual scholasticism nerds, that scholars do continue to argue today about whether the author of the Ephesians letter was literally Paul himself or a follower of Paul, very very close to Paul and mentored by him. But But the letter to the Ephesians, and let's leave that question aside for now, it has nothing to say in that passage at least about the earthly life and ministry of Jesus. The purpose of that letter is to describe a transcendent and divine Son of the Most High God, cosmologically enthroned at the pinnacle and the greatest depths of all we know, seen and unseen. This is heady stuff. I worry that when we focus only on this divine Christ, we might neglect to see Jesus, the itinerant rabbi, walking dirt roads in his sandals and sleeping wherever he was invited. But then again... If we focus too much on Jesus, the human teacher, healer, and social provocateur, we may not recognize the divine and universal Christ with us always here today. And for my two cents, it's very important that we know both. The fancy word here in consideration of all this is Christology. In very basic terms, 
we can use the phrase a low Christology to admire and be moved by Jesus as the historical man without worrying over questions of divinity. Holding what we might call a high Christology is to regard Christ as awesome and mysterious, divine in nature, and effectively indistinguishable from God. Like all good Christian mystics, we should hold those things together, seeing no division between them. As students and followers of the way of Jesus of Nazareth, taking our beliefs and values and convictions and example from him, and as those who pray and rest and grow and daily live anew in the divine Christ. At the risk of having our community here feel like an old time tent revival meeting, I'm going to share some personal testimony. I was perhaps 21 or 22 years of age uh, when my very low Christology was blown completely out of the water. I'm generally bashful in sharing this story in public places as I've long experienced the retelling of vivid spiritual experiences from others who are quite quite possibly mad, which often invites scepticism from me. And yet I too, also quite possibly mad, had a Damascus Road moment in which I experienced meeting the risen Christ in my lounge room in a dirty and smelly student share house. I saw Christ, but describing the experience as a vision seems inadequate as the presence of this one that I immediately recognised as Christ was, was tangible, palpable, as real to me as any person sitting in the front row of worship which doesn't work out and there's no one sitting in the front row of worship, in the second row of worship. It was a meeting. It was a, a visitation, as real as a visit through the front door to me. And though I downplayed and doubted the reality of this ecstatic and questionable experience for some years after, it was a conversion moment. I went in that moment from being an admirer of the historical Jesus to being drawn into the mysterious and wondrous truth of Jesus, the divine and eternal Christ. And it was a lot. (coughs) And it was beautiful. And I pushed it to the back of my head and tried to forget it for many years. But each time I returned to the memory, even during my years of putting that aside as some possibly delusional experience, And each time I return to that memory today, and I wonder if it was imagination or delusion or something greater and more meaningful, what I remember absolutely is the feeling of love that radiated in that presence so undeniably. Immersed in that love as I was, a love that filled the space, that filled me, like something I'd never known. I knew Jesus, a man who had been, and I knew the divine Christ who had always been, And the two were one and the same. Something clicked in me. That love, like nothing I'd felt before, was both fully human and fully divine. And in that moment, at least, all residue of my past existential angst was gone. And to to be clear, that singular moment in my life didn't fix me. But it started me on a journey towards oneness in which I continue to crawl on my way. And because I knew then, and I have known since, Christ in all things, I believe Christ is truly and literally universal. I believe many people of all faiths and many people of no faith meet and live in Christ sometimes without knowing it, without considering Jesus or reading the Bible or praying in a traditionally recognized religious way or vaguely considering themselves a Christian. All people who shine from within by their life shown in peace, love, truth and grace, these people, whether they like it or not, as far as I'm concerned, are alive in Christ and are invariably exemplars, even unconsciously, of the way of our Master Jesus. I've said it before, the kingdom of God is not evidenced by what we decide we believe in, but what we demonstrate we belove in. Crucially, On this reign of Christ Sunday, our reading from Matthew is not one of expansive theology, but a very specific list of the practical tasks Jesus the Christ asks and expects of us. Feed the hungry, give water to the thirsty, welcome the stranger, clothe the naked, care for the sick, visit the imprisoned. 
by following these very clear instructions in service to the least of these. We buy these actions, bow down in wonder, awe, and surrender to the King of universal love reigning on earth here and now as in heaven. To bring this home, I'd like us to examine ourselves for any thoughts we've had in the past or we still hold today that equate to something like, geez, Louise, I wish the world would hurry up and get its act together so Jesus could come back. Do you ever think that? At some level, probably not in those words. Look, do you look around the community and our world and wish the share house that is global human society would just tidy itself up and get things all nice for the big rent inspection so we can all relax when the landlord comes knocking? Jesus is coming, better look busy, goes the old joke. And what though, if there is nothing separating us from, or preventing, or delaying, or distancing the reign of Christ? What if Christ is going about appearing to confused everyday people in their smelly sharehouse lounge rooms? What if grace and love and peace need only to be enacted, need only to be incarnated by everyday people, in our very ordinary daily lives, for all to see and meet the one who is reigning here and now and is impossibly close to all people and all things. Peace be with you.